Hello, I'm Philip Maris and I'm uh, visiting Ari van Nieke, if I said that right, who is uh, the world's most experienced person in the, applying the theory of constraints to the mining industry. And through his 90 plus uh, implementations, uh, he's developed a point of view that there are four different types of uh, mines uh, to be optimized. So tell us about yourself and, and these, these four different types of mines. Thank you, Philip. It's a pleasure to be here. Privileged to have this conversation. I'm Ari van Nikak. Yes, you're right. It's 20 years. Phenomenal journey. Uh, more than 90 implementations. I've seen 20% improvement, 30% improvement, 40% improvement, even more. Without any investment? Without any investment. All, most of this was done with the same people, the same infrastructure, but different thinking. You can just imagine an underground mining operation. You don't, don't change the infrastructure in six months. And we've seen these improvements in a very short period of time. I, I've learned to, to, to distinguish four types of mining when it comes to, to the theory of constraints, implementation and improvements. The first is open cast mining, where we remove the overburden and develop a pit and from there feed the, feed the ore into the plant. The second one is the oldest um, underground mining operation, which is conventional mining, mostly track bound, where we develop tunnel, tunnels, we gain access to the ore body, and then we manually drill and blast and get the ore out. Then there are mechanical mining methods, which is uh, the more modern, pop popular approach. And there are two main categories. One is for hard rock, where we drill and blast, and that can either be board and pillar or massive mining extraction methods or mechanical cutters where, where we actually cut the coal and from there feed it into the process. So those are the four main categories. I'd like to first talk about the conventional underground mining mm -hmm. because I think that's where I spend, spend most, of, most of my time and that's where we saw some phenomenal results. Mm -hmm. In this mining method, you, you, you sink a vertical shaft we develop our horizontal tunnels below the ore body and then we enter through traveling ways onto the reef itself and then we blast razors onto the reef from where we mechanically then drill it, blast it and extract the ore. Of course, when people enter into those spaces, we have to do it safely. Mm -hmm. So support, roof support and, 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 and pillar support and stick support, and all kinds of support methods. It's extremely important mm -hmm. for people to be safe so that they can work there. You need ventilation, you need the right temperature, you need compressed air, water, and access for people in a safe mm -hmm. and proper way. And what we've learned in these mining environments is that very seldom do you find that the vertical shaft is the bottleneck. Most of the shafts that we encounter, the shafts have... A, a, have enough capacity mm -hmm. and the shafts will be idle 20 to 30 or even more percent of the time. Okay. There are a few cases where the vertical shaft becomes the bottleneck and then we have very specific solutions for it. The shaft schedule becomes important, you want to put full cars down, uh, empty cars out, you want to maximize the, the flow rate of the oil and minimize the waste, the wasting of waste. Mm -hmm. And then the, the shaft schedule and shaft timing it becomes critically important. But in most cases where that's not the bottleneck, the bottleneck is typically underground. And imagine you've got different levels, all parallel flows into the vertical shaft, mm -hmm. which means you could actually have a different bottleneck at every level. Yeah. Sometimes it's the horizontal tramming, sometimes it's the stoping itself, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the development of, of, of developing the ore body and, and creating more access. Mm -hmm. So you can have different bottlenecks at different levels. And that, for that reason, we developed the so-called half-level or level-based theory of constraints model, where we look at each half-level or each level or half-level, we identify the bottlenecks, and then we've got unique ways of, of, of improving it. But what we've learned... In that particular, in, in ma manual, conventional mining, yeah. availability of enough people to do the work is a significant bottleneck. And 
we have to provide enough people so that we have a full complement crew on the working phase every single day. Because if you lose a blast today, you cannot blast, blast twice tomorrow. So if you're a lost blast today, is a lost blast forever. Mm. So we, we, would, we are advocating that we should actually have a skills buffer available to have the right number of people of the right skills on that working phase every single day. And this is contradictory to the normal way that we do things in mining. And so to have a skills buffer or a labor buffer. And then on top of it, you must have the right materials. All the material that the crew might need must be available at start of shift. And enough quantities so that if there's a problem tomorrow with supplying them with what they need, that they will not come to a standstill. And then on top of it, we're talking about wind shares, we're talking about drilling machines, we're talking about pumps, air legs, lots of equipment. So we, from a theory of constraints point of view, we provide buffers of those as well, as close as possible to the working places. So if you have enough people on the job, you have the right material, you have the right equipment, then the probability of getting that daily blast just increases significantly. And this has been the, 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 the power of the solution. Mm -hmm. But to some degree, it's a little bit counterintuitive to the way we've been doing things for the last uh, few decades. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second type? The second type of mining is uh, where we also where we spend also a lot of time is the open cast mining. When open cast mining, you start with overburden removal, mm -hmm. and then there's a pit that's designed with different levels, and in the pit we've got different operations. You, you have to drill, you have, first you have to prepare this, the, 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 the blocks, yeah. so that you can, then you start drilling, drilling in the right patterns, mm -hmm. and to get the right type of fragmentation, and then you charge it up and blast it, and then you load it with, with, with big, big power shovels mm -hmm. onto trucks, and the trucks then take it to either to the to the crusher or to the run of mine stockpile. What we found is the traditional way of managing these is to have just enough drills, just enough shovels, just enough trucks. And then what you see is that the bottleneck will shift between, between these three major components in the, in the system. Yeah. So at some stage the drilling becomes the bottleneck. Then you put a lot of focus and then you start drilling a little bit more and then you provide enough blast of rock and then the shovels might become the constraint. And then as the pit gets deeper or you are mining on the, on the further part of the pit, then the trucks become the bottleneck. In other words, the shovels start waiting for the trucks, but if you're mining closer to the plant, the, the, the trucks are waiting for the shovel. So you're fluctuating between queuing and waiting. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, we try to optimize everything. And in the process, we never optimize anything. Mm -hmm. And we don't realize that in, in a mining pit like this, everything varies every single day. So what we are advocating from theory of constraints is to build enough buffers in between these processes mm -hmm. so that the, these processes are not interfering with each other which means we want to have enough blasted rock in front of the shovels. We want enough, sh enough, shovel, uh, enough trucks to, so that the shovels can load the trucks at the right rate and then feed it into, into the crushing system or the processing plant. But I'd like to add one other thing that we've discovered with theory of constraints. Having a run of mine stockpile, mm -hmm. and sometimes more than one stockpile, of, the right gra of different grades so that we can blend from those stockpiles into the crusher at the right uh, grade feed for the processing plant. Mm -hmm. And this is also a little bit of counterintuitive to the normal way we do things. The normal way is to try and optimize everything. Mm -hmm. No stockpiles, no double handling. But what we are advocating is sometimes exactly the opposite. is to maximize the flow. But in order to do that, you have to know exactly where your bottle is. And I know this may sound controversial, but where we would like the bottleneck to be is at the processing plant, because it's by far the most expensive piece of equipment. That's where you make your real money. The real money comes only when you sell the product, not if you have efficiency or utilization in the pit. 
and because the grade of, of, of the, in the pit is, uh, is, is a high degree of uncertainty to it, we do not always get the right ore in the right quantities at the right place where we predict them to be. Yeah. So that's where we need some flexibility. So we need flexibility in that in the pit itself, and in, in order to deal with that, to create that flexibility and deal with the variation, we must have protective capacity in the pit, and then force the bottleneck to be to the processing plant. And by doing that, typically we've seen 15, 20, even more percent improvement. Of the overall flow of the system as well. Yeah. And the number of tons per day, whatever. That's the number of tons per day produced. Yeah. That, and I'm talking final product. Yeah. And if you feed a constant blend into the processing plant, the processing plant is much more stable than when you're feeding, feeding variation in, uh, in, okay. in the grain. So tell us about the third type of mine. The third type of mine that's very common is massive or uh, massive hard rock mining or underground mining. Mm -hmm. And in this m mining operation, there are two big components. The first is the development of access, is the tunnels into the ore body itself. Mm -hmm. And once you're into the ore body, that's when you start mining the massive ore or, 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 or the stoping or stooping, depending on what terminology you use. What we discovered over many implementations mm -hmm. is that the development is relatively slower than the stopping. So if you don't develop fast enough, you simply don't have enough ore for the massive flow. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, because we're under pressure to produce, we start stopping faster and then we catch up with development. Mm -hmm. And then the development and stopping gets in each other's way. And then the whole system slows down significantly. And to get yourself out of that tightrope is very, very difficult. So we, we learned the hard way that what you have to do is to really focus on the development and develop it preferably 20% faster than what you expect the stoping to, to demand. Which means you're creating a buffer of exposed ore yeah. and, if, and you have to maintain that almost at all costs because if you don't do that you run the risk that you catch up and then the output of the system will drop exponentially mm. yeah. and many mechanized mining operations have found themselves in that yeah. situation and to, 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 to find the solution we've got different techniques of, of sch scheduling the activities in development. Yeah. Typically, we would have different areas for, 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 for drilling and cleaning and supporting. And with the theory of constraints view, we approach this a little bit different. Yeah, that's what well, we talked about it. Uh, and I've talked about it in other videos that you, you have to be, if you want to properly implement the, the theory of constraints, you have to prepare to succeed that's because you're going to get quickly a lot more efficient doing the, the, the short-term stuff. Uh, in bi commercial business, you have to make sure that you know where the future sales are going to come from. And in your case, you've got to make sure you know where the, where the next piece of ore you're going to be, you're going to be uh, mining is because everything's going to speed up. Yes, and if you do the development in, in a flow model yeah. rather than an efficiency model, yeah. we found that typically that you'll get 20 to 30% improvement. 20 to With 30. the same equipment, the same people, but once again, significantly different thinking. Right. And that's the real challenge. So there's the theory of constraints. You just said uh, doing it differently, you get 20 or 30% more, more tons per day or whatever in, in the mining environment, for instance. Okay, so tell us about the, the, the fourth case. The fourth case is typically what we find in coal seams, yeah. where we use mechanical cutters as big machines with rotating cutters. Yeah. And it's the continuous miner uh, cutting into the coal. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the cut material gets fed into a feeder onto a shuttle car. The shuttle car, there are typically three shuttle cars running, running in parallel, and the shuttle car will feed it onto a feeder breaker onto the conveyor belt system. Now you can just sense what's happening here. You've got the cutter, you've got the shuttle cars, you've got the feeder breaker directly onto the, onto the conveyor belt. If any link in that chain gets broken, the whole chain comes to a standstill. So the level of interdependency is extremely high. But then we add something else. Once you've cut uh, 
to, to a certain length into the coal, and depending on the depends on the on the on the roof conditions, you have to pull out that cutter and support the roof. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, if the roof con- if the roof support conditions are such that it's very slow, mm-hmm. that, that the roof support takes longer than the cutter, mm-hmm. the bolting, the roof support becomes the bottleneck. Mm-hmm. But the whole system is actually set up as if the continuous miner is the bottleneck. And then we def- define very serious conflicts here that we can lose up to t- sometimes two to three to four hours per shift that the continuous miner, the CM, is waiting for roof support. But yet, irrespective of the, the, the layout of the ore body, with the, there's a standard configuration for mining. Now, what theory of constraints brings is says, no, identify the bottleneck. And if the bottleneck is the bolter, you have to really zoom in and focus and get that bolting operation really well. And sometimes we will suggest a, a, a change in the kit that we need for that kind of operation. But that needs a little bit of deeper analysis. But if you do that, once again, 20, 30, 40% improvement. Thank you. Uh, so those, that, those are the four types of problems that you, you, you uh, take into account when you're applying theory of constraints to mining. You've just been talking about the, the, the mine, uh, and yet I know because we've discussed it in several of your uh, success stories, that you... you <coughs> little by little or maybe right from the beginning you stand back and you look at the thing there's the mine there's the plant then maybe there's the train to take it to the uh, so tell us about this even higher level view of, of mining theory of constraints is a systems approach mm-hmm. so whenever we start any project we look holistically and find try to discover where the bottleneck is in this whole flow chain yeah. and in many cases, it's in the mining operation. So the plant gets starved. Every now and then the plant has to stop or run at lower rate because there's not enough feed. But the moment we start lifting the performance in the, in, in the mining operation, we, we, we lift the performance of the processing plant. The, the stockpiles or product stockpile starts growing. And if you can sell more and the downstream logistics can take more, then it's fine. But very often we have to look at that whole system. And sometimes other parts of that system belongs to other parties. Mm -hmm. And then we have to get all the parties together. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it's a bit of a challenge. To get all the parties together, see the holistic picture, and develop a strategic solution for so that all of us can make more money. And, And once people see it, and they see the simplicity of the theory of constraints approach. It's not that difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, so the solutions are quite often simple, but the change in thinking is not that always that simple. Mm-hmm. And uh, but every time we've done this, we saw some significant improvements. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ari. The probably the most experienced guy in, in applying the theory of constraints to the mining industry uh, and his description of the types of problems and the types of solutions that uh, he practices. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. It's a pleasure spending time.